Dear fellow redeemed, we consider especially our reading from the prophet Habakkuk. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and usually that's about as far as people read when it comes to Charles Dickens, at least aside from Christmas Carol, and personally the Muppet Christmas Carol is the best of the bunch. But the rest of it reads like this. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity, it was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. And with those words, reading a book entitled The Tale of Two Cities, that's the way that Charles Dickens starts out. And whether it's something that you picked up for fun or something that was inflicted on you some point during your education, you can't miss what Charles Dickens is saying in a rather heavy-handed sort of way. That when he talks about the best of times and the worst of times in every, every sort of way that he can describe, what he's talking about is not two cities, but one. Two cities within that one city where there are those who are having the best of times and those who are at the bottom of the social ladder. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. In that one city, two groups of people with two very different experiences. And that's a little bit of what is going on and a little bit like what is in the background in our reading from Habakkuk. And as we begin to look at what Habakkuk says, I think the other idea that we have to, we have to understand a little bit is that, is that if we get the purpose off, if we misunderstand the purpose, the, the main goal that God is trying to accomplish here, then the end result is we will be looking for all sorts of wrong comfort. If we get the purpose off, We'll be looking for all sorts of wrong comfort. And I think this was, this was brought out to me just recently this past week. One of the, the cool things about being a pastor is that when people are driving around the city, they ask me, well, pastor, I just saw this on a sign outside of a church. What does this mean? Excellent question. And this particular sign highlights one of the... the, the primary biggest dangers facing Christians today, facing the Christian church, which is getting the purpose wrong. And the sign, the sign sounds nice enough, and you might even understand it properly, that if you ask, Jesus can take away your fears. That, that for some reason, as if to say the purpose why Jesus came would be to take away our fears. And you and I know that, and we even sing about that. Um, I know that my Redeemer lives. He lives to silence all my fears. He lives to wipe away my tears. And that's true. But that is the result of his primary work. The result of his original purpose for coming, which is to carry sin and to take sin away. And just on that sign like that, it highlighted, highlighted at least for me, this, um, this switch of the primary purpose for Jesus coming from taking away sin to taking away fear. And you can just switch those two words around. Take away fear, take away sin. And where it ends up. That if the primary purpose of Jesus coming is to take away your sin, to prepare you for heaven and have you ready for the judgment, then the primary focus of what we do is to rejoice to rejoice together at the forgiveness that Jesus has won and to rejoice together at the righteousness that he distributes in a very real way. If Jesus simply came to take away our fear, then that opens the door to understanding that the goal of Christian faith is to help me attain my potential, to help me live up to everything that I could be, almost like a slogan from the Marines, what, 20, 30 years ago. Be all that you can be. 
And that is one of the, the primary false teachings that is pretty much everywhere within the Christian church. It's in a lot of music. It's on signs as you drive around Toledo. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. That if we get the purpose wrong, if we get the, the purpose wrong, we will be looking for the wrong solution. If the purpose is simply that Jesus came to take away your fear so that you can live up to your potential and be all that God had designed you to be, then, then our focus will be wrong. And Habakkuk's words will be of very little comfort. If the purpose is, as we see throughout the rest of Scripture, the purpose that Jesus came to take away sin and to not help you to live up to your potential, but to crucify within you and within me through his sacrament of holy baptism, to crucify the uh, absolute potential and reality of our sinful flesh, to drown that sinful flesh so that he would create within you a new person to live before him in righteousness and holiness forever. If that is his purpose in coming, then you and I live in this, this best of times. You and I look forward to this coming of Christ with joy. And then Habakkuk, Habakkuk's words will make all the sense in the world. Because then, when we don't confuse the, the fear with sin, but we see Christ's purpose in taking away sin, then we will see what Habakkuk is saying in the proper light and with the proper application. The book of Habakkuk, I mean, if you've got a few minutes when you get home, probably will only take you about six or seven minutes to read. It's only three chapters long. But it's this conversation where Habakkuk acts as the spokesman for the people, where life in, in Israel had been spiraling downward. Sure, there were the external pressures, um, inflation, there was the risk of famine, there was the risk of what will happen if this other foreign country invades or if the warfare over there spills over into our nation. But Habakkuk was looking around and he said, where's the justice? Where is the justice in all of this? He had seen the poor oppressed and the rich just got richer and the courts were doing their task and the criminals were getting away with their crimes and the law was even being leveraged against the people as if to say that the law was there to protect the wrongdoer and the innocent party was wondering where. Where will I find justice? Habakkuk said, you know what, Lord, this looks like the worst of times. You said, you said that we were your people. And yet, where is the justice? Where is the judgment? And as we talk about the return of Christ here at the end of time, it's very easy to get distracted and to have a, a, a poor perspective on what exactly we know will be happening. It is very easy to get up, caught up in all the complaints and the politics of the day, definitely. It is very easy to get caught up in all the distractions that this world has to offer. It is very easy to think to ourselves, well, I've got time and that'll come when, you know, maybe in a long time from now. I've got time. I don't have to take care of anything today. It's not absolutely, absolutely pressing. But what is pressing is injustice or climate change. What is pressing is that I wish that things in my life had been happening a little bit better, a little bit differently. And what I really need, what I really need is a Savior who's going to reassure me that it's going to be okay today. And there's that switch where Jesus coming to take away our sin is thought of as distant and far away. And our fear looms right in our face. Where Jesus' forgiveness seems just like a down payment for tomorrow where it seems like the, the gate to heaven is open for tomorrow. But as for me, and as for my concerns today, well, what is Jesus going to do about that? 
because I've got things that I need to take care of. I've got things that I wish had happened differently. I've got concerns when I look at the world around me and when I look at the heart within me. What will Jesus do about those? There's the best of times. There's the worst of times. And with those words, even Charles Dickens reminds us that, that we live in a city. That our heart is a city with two competing ideas. The idea that, yes, the Christian heart says, I want to serve my Lord. And the other idea that says, I need more from my Lord. The Christian heart that says, I know what my Lord has done for me. And the other idea that says, I don't think he's done enough. And in thinking that way, or in those thoughts rising in our hearts and minds, we risk missing out on what Habakkuk is saying. He says, the people are looking for justice. The people are looking for, for God to come down and do what is right. The people are looking for, for God to correct the ills of society, and he should. But the righteous will live by faith. The Lord answered me, record the vision and write it plainly on tablets. <laughs> and I don't know about you, when I first read that, I was thinking like iPads. Write it plainly on tablets or on large sheets of paper, posters, so that a herald may run with it. Indeed, the vision is waiting for the appointed time. It longs for fulfillment and will not prove false. If it seems slow in coming, wait for it, because it will certainly come and not be delayed. And when Habakkuk writes that, it's really what he has to say to the entire nation of Israel, to the entire group of believers who will hear these words, to the group of believers of all time who will hear these words. Because God isn't ignoring the injustice of the day. God is certainly paying attention to that. And God is not ignoring the other problems of the day, be they political or, or supply chain or the, the rain and the famine in Israel. He wasn't ignorant of it, and he wasn't looking the other way. He certainly wasn't asleep at the switch. And God wasn't primarily even concerned about the fear that his people had about the future. But he said, give them this word. I've got one word for you, that even if, even if it looks like it takes a long time to come, even if it looks like the arrogant are winning, even if it looks like the wealthy are influencing the courts to their own good, even if it looks like the rest of the world is just spiraling downward in this slow spiral and just pick your thing to be worried about, it doesn't matter whether you're talking... There's more than enough to worry about in this world. But he says, here's the, here's the point. Even if God is long in coming, the righteous one will live by faith. The righteous one will live by faith. And that's simple enough to, to hear and understand when we are warm and well-fed. It might be a different thing entirely if we were living in Jerusalem and there was an army at the border. It's simple enough to understand when we can worship with fellow Christians in peace and safety. <coughs> it might be a different thing to pray that and to know that if we heard of a crowd walking down the street with sledgehammers to tear our church building down. And it's simple enough to hear the righteous will live by faith. Okay, all right, wonderful. But Jesus, I'm still concerned about my family, my marriage, my job, my social security. What does Jesus have to say about my fear? Because we still live in 
this place that is the best of times and the worst of times, that even if everything takes a turn for the absolute worst, for the Christian, it is still and always the best of times because the righteous will live by faith. And that is the turning point here in the book of Habakkuk, and that is the entire point as he goes all the way through the end of the book of Habakkuk, that the righteous will live by faith. When he says that, he says to you and to me that your Lord knows, your Lord cares, your Lord is watching, and your Lord will provide. When he says that the righteous will live by faith, he says, dear Christian, do you see, do you see the amount of, um, of wealth that God has placed into your hands. Not just what you can count, but that key to the city, the great city with the, the gate of pearl. Do you see the, the promise that your Lord has made to you? And that same promise holds true throughout all of history, that even in Habakkuk's day, when God had said that the righteous will live by faith, even in Habakkuk's day, God said, just wait and see, and you will hear, and you will see how God will act. That God will not let the injustice just roll on by. That God will continue. And that God will even, even things out in the end. That God will carry out justice when he returns. And the encouragement for Christians, for you and for me, is that we have this Lord who has promised to you and to me the best of times amidst the worst of times. Because of his forgiveness. Because of that truth that he has brought us into relationship with one another and with him. Because of that truth that he reiterates to you and to me, not just in what he says, but in what he gives. What he gives is that continued ability to persevere. To believe what Habakkuk says when he says that the righteous will live by faith. That's not something you or I have to work up within ourselves as if to say, all right, well, I'm going to just bury my head in the sand and hope, that, and hope that my Lord will come through in the end. No, he's proven it time and again. He's proven it in the resurrection of his son from the dead. He's proven it in the gifts that he has given to you today and in the promises that he has fulfilled tomorrow and will fulfill tomorrow. Because when Jesus talks, when Jesus talks, he says in, um, in Luke chapter 12 that the Son of Man will come at, an, at a time when you're not expecting him, whether it be the best of times and a bustling economy in this world, or whether it looks like the worst of times, that he will come. And those who have lived by faith, those who are righteous by faith, our Lord himself will dress himself as the servant and say, come, enjoy your master's happiness. Come and sit at his table. Come and enjoy the feast. And that's always the tension. That for the Christian, we know the reality of what our Lord has promised. And we know that he has said these things and we know the value, or at least some of the value of these spiritual blessings. But we don't always see how that plays out in our lives. And we might be tempted to, to stand there alongside Habakkuk and say, well, how long? How long will you put up with the injustice of this world? How long will you put up with the sin of people? The, the obvious sin that we can see. And that silent cry. How long? And all he has to say is, dear Christian, a little while longer, a little while longer for you to live as a Christian, to, for you to live as light in a dark world. A little while longer, and no matter what happens between now and the return of Christ Jesus from heaven, no matter what happens, that you live in the best of cities and the best of times, because you live under the undying and eternal favor of God. That God smiles upon you today the exact same way that he smiles upon the believers in heaven right now. That the Lord cares for you today exactly as he has cared for his people of all time. That the Lord will follow through with his justice at the appointed time. 
And you can be ready for that and look forward to that day, that day with joy because, because of Christ's righteousness that is yours through faith. So when you get home, um, I don't encourage a whole lot of Charles Dickens, but if, if you haven't read him in a while, maybe start with The Christmas Carol. But even more approachable than Charles Dickens is the three little short chapters of Habakkuk, where Habakkuk says that even if, even if it should be that we live what looks like the worst of times, that as a believer, we live in the best of times, today and always. And as that conversation goes back and forth throughout the book of Habakkuk, it concludes with one of my, one of my uh, favorite passages in all of Scripture. I know I say that a lot. And it, it reads like this, the end of Habakkuk chapter 3. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In your wrath, remember mercy. And then this is how the book concludes. Even though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Habakkuk really ends by saying, well, he thought he was, at the beginning of the book, he thought he was living in this best of times and worst of times, as if the best of times belonged only to those with the strength, power, and influence, and the worst of times belonged to everybody else. And he concludes the book by seeing that he does live in the best of times, even if he does live during the worst of times. That even if every food source that they had was empty and gone, he says, as a Christian, as a believer, we always live in the best of times, even as we look ahead to the greater times to come. That's faith. Amen. Amen.